to another board game breakfast and I am so thankful that you guys allowed me to take a week off. Sorry, some people emailed me and said, where's board game breakfast? And I apologize, but it was extremely restful last week. In fact, it was too restful, so I'm gonna do extra work this week to make up for it because it drove me crazy to do nothing. Although I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, we're in the month of May now and Origins is on the horizon. And I wanna encourage you guys, if you are going to the Origins Game Convention to sign up for our live show that we'll be doing there, It'll be me and Z and Eric and some of the other guys. And we'll be doing it at nine o'clock on Saturday night at Origins. Come on out, have a great time. Uh, sign up for that and come by and say hi to us while we're there. Uh, we're, there's other events. We're going to put a list of them on the Dice Tower website. So keep an eye out for that. In fact, you know, check the Dice Tower website. I'm going to also post, I'm going to start posting on the Dice Tower website when we're doing live shows and have those on the Dice Tower website so that you guys know. Speaking of that, today at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll be doing a live question and answer. So if you have any questions, you can come then. And we'll be doing live gaming this week. What games and when are still to be determined, but I should have that figured out by Tuesday at least. So come back and check again at the Dice Tower website. All right, enough of this nonsense. Let's get to the news. Well, several things. First of all, the Mensa Gaming Awards were announced. Now, the way these awards work are basically people who go to a specific convention style for Mensa. They go together for basically a weekend and they play lots of different games. They go play a game here, play a game here, play a game here, play a game here, and they vote on these games. And then they give an award to five different games. The games are The Castles of Mad King Ludwig, uh, Dragonwood, Lanterns, Letter Tycoon, and Trekking the National Parks. Now, of those, I have not played, actually, I think I've only played in Castles of Mad King Ludwig. That's a pretty good pick. And it's, you know, they used to pick much more mainstream games. Now they're picking some of these cooler gamer style games. And this will be interesting to see how this continues. Ah, Fantasy Flight has announced, shockingly, another expansion for Eldritch Horror called Strange Remnants. This is another one of their smaller expansions, which looks like it adds more stuff and has Syzygy <laughs> as a monster in it. Um, and shocking nobody, uh, AG announces another expand, another love letter, Adventure Time. Eventually, you're going to see a shelf behind me that's full of every kind of love letter in existence. No, you're not. I just I'm keeping Batman. Uh, Stronghold announced a new version of Survive. Now this is being designed by the Angle Scenes and looks like it's a take on the Survive system, which is a very popular game about island sinking, and this time it's in space. Now I'm kind of really curious about this because I thought the theming of Survive was like perfect, right? The island sinking, people are trying to escape off Atlantis. How will that work in space? What kind of spin will the Angle Scenes put on it? I don't know, I'm curious, I'm doubtful, but I'm curious. Uh, let's see here. Um, Rattle Battle Grab the Loot has been announced by Portal Games. This game looks fun. We're basically rolling dice and how they roll determines what happens. It's kind of a, an, an interesting take on the dice rolling mechanism. Uh, Gale Force 9 has announced Superstar Showdown from WWE. Are you ready to rumble? Uh, you know, normally a WWE game would not interest me much at all, even though I, I may have watched a wrestling match or two here, you know, uh, some of us. Anyhow, uh, but th that's not the point. The, the point is, it looks, on first glance, you're like, ah, wrestling game, whatever, pass. But Gale Force 9 has taken other properties and made them games that people have really enjoyed. So maybe they'll do it with this one. And I think it'll be really exciting that wrestling fans will play this game and go, wow, board games are actually fun. What other games out there are out there? Wrestling has a lot of fans. Yellow has gotten the rights to Dungeon Fighter. Dungeon Fighter is a game where you roll dice or you're bouncing dice and that's how you determine whether you hit somebody or not. Uh, it's a game that it's in my collection still. I think it's a great game. And um, I saw on Bruno Fiduti's blog, I saw that he and Bruno Cadala, the Bruno connection, are designing a game called Raptor about dinosaurs from Matago. Wow, that's amazing. The two Brunos and Matago, I'm very pleased about that. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. 
Uh, Russell wrote in, and earlier, uh, a month or so ago, Sam Healy and I played a live game of Imperial Assault Tactical, the Tactical Battle. And he wrote in to tell us how awful we had played, both in how we picked <laughs> our armies. He said that was a terrible strategy choices. It was pretty bad. Um, how we played. We made bad decisions all around. So after that very nice email, he said that he wasn't trying to criticize. Okay. <laughs> but he was bothered by the fact that this happens in many of his gaming group, he polled the people in his gaming group and found that most people in his gaming group had five games or less that they had played more than five times. And it bothered him that it seems like most people don't play games a lot, and therefore he says there's no strategy. How can you have fun if you don't learn the strategy of a game? How can you have fun just, is it fun just to learn games? And he says playing them randomly. So. Well, I play a lot of games a lot of times. I also play a lot of games one time. Yes. But I think as you play more and more games, you should be, you'll learn to pick up what the strategy of a game is as you play it the first time. You don't necessarily need to play a game 20 times to have a strategy down. You can play the game once and say, I see where this is going. I see how to do this to turns into this, turns into this. So I think that just comes from breadth of experience of gaming that you can do the same thing with one game. But on the other hand, there's games like uh, Puerto Rico. I think I played 500 plus times. I don't even know how many. Thank you, Brett Spielwelt, for that. Um, or many other games like that. I played, you know, Lost Cities plenty of times. I played a lot of games plenty of times. And as you do play games more times, especially more strategic games, something like a Twilight Struggle, you'll see more strategy of what kind of cards you want to play when. But in general, I think once you've played a lot of games and you get through the experience of learning how to strategize, you can do it on one play just as easily. Right, and, and, and Jason and I, we play a lot of different games. And it's possible that we are fooled by a game, but usually when we get out a new game and we set it up and I go over all the rules, and we're like, okay, all right, good. I know maybe not the best strategy for this game, but we know a pretty good strategy at that point. Just yeah. because we play, oh, it's a worker placement game, well, it, we play enough worker placement games to know that more workers is a good idea. So we know that usually, and you know, we have to take other things into account. Some people like to put a lot of effort into one game. They play chess their whole lives. They play Twilight Struggle and um, many, many times. And that's fine if that's what you like to do. But I think I would be very hesitant to criticize those who don't. For someone like me, I, there's some games I've played many, many times, like Jason, and there's games I've played a lot less. Honor. Right, but there's games I've played a lot less, and for yeah. me, the fun of gaming is not, I have destroyed my opponents. I get fun out of the, the discovery of new things. When I play games, that happens, I'm like, that's really cool. I love those moments, and I don't care, and I also like to say, ooh, what if I took some you know, Royal Guards with IG-88? Is that the optimal thing to do? Maybe not, but it's fun. What do I care? <laughs> and that is obviously a personality difference between you, Russell, and myself, and the fact is, I don't care. And I don't mind that you like to win at all costs or have that, you know, learn more and more, more, more strategy. For me, I just want the fun experiences. Well, it's funny because I usually care about strategy a lot, and I'm, I'm all, working on I'm, it. I'm pretty much a, I want to optimize the game, optimize the strategy, try to find the best moves possible. Um, and what's funny is we were just playing Dominion the other day, the new um, Adventures one, and I said, I just want to try all the adventure cards. I want to do the guy that turns into the guy that turns into the guy, the peasant that turns into like five different things to a teacher. And then after the game, I was fourth place out of four. And Tom's like, that's because we all did the normal strategy and you just wanted to do that. I'm like, yeah, I wanted to see how it worked. It's just like Dice Masters. Well, to I, be fair, I got third out of... No, I got four out of four. You beat me. No, 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 I didn't. I was like 14 points. You were like 20 right. points. You I all wailed on me. What, but I mean, no, but I understand that. And I, and I agree with that. And... But So I'm corrupting you, and I'm pleased about that. <laughs> but hey, if you want to play differently, I don't have any skin in that either. I may not always want to play a game with you. Like there are some people that I won't play Teach You With, for example. Because they played 100 million games of it, and when they get a hand, they're like, oh. They know exactly what I to pass. Do. And I'm like, oh, I'm having fun here. And they're like, what? Why, you, did you pass a, why did you pass an odd card to the left when it's supposed to be to the right? Yeah, and that's okay. I don't mind if they do that, but you should probably play with each other. <laughs> Anyhow. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Ask us questions at Dicetower at gmail.com. Hey, everybody. Steve here, and here's your AFR two-minute drill. So I was just in the middle of 
playing out a game here and it got me thinking what's the most times I've ever played a single game now one of the great things about sports games is that they really lend themselves to multiple playthroughs whether you're doing a full season or if you're just doing a single team playthrough you're gonna play through a lot of different individual games so with History Maker Baseball here, for instance, I've played over 400 individual games. Replay Basketball, I probably played over 100 times. And then another baseball game, Replay Baseball, I probably played that over 200 times. So I'd be interested in hearing from everybody, what's the most times you've ever played through a single game? Look forward to hearing everyone's comments. Be sure to tune in to the After Further Review show every Tuesday evening for all the sports board game news. And then you can follow us on our Facebook and Twitter page for breaking news throughout the week. Until next time, my name's Steve, and you've been watching the AFR 2-Minute Drill. First thing we're looking at here are called Zen Bins. Now this is a way to collect your collectible dice games. Yeah, okay, like there's how many of those? There's Dice Masters, although Quarriers I guess would fit in here too. And there's multiple bins, and the way it works right now is you have to basically use one of them as a lid. Although they have a lid on the Kickstarter, I don't have one. And this, this actually drives me a little crazy. I would want the lid because it, I feel like I'm wasting this space, this bin, since it's just a lid. But the way these work, you see that there's dice in here and there's spots to put cards in each one. So as you open them up, you can see that you can stack, you can put a ton of dice in these things. So I'm kind of torn on these because I really like them. Uh, I think they're great. They, they hold the dice perfectly. Although, for storage purposes, I'm not sure how I would use them. Would I put the dice in like this, put five down in a column like this for each of the different types. Would I store them like this? I'm not sure. I just kind of have the dice thrown in here to show the different types. And also, I'm a little concerned for um, you know purposes of when you pop them off, if you're not careful because they pop apart, it's easy for the dice to shake. However, when you have them the lid on, I will say there is the benefit. I'm really shaking these around and they're not moving at all. So I think to hold everything, this is one not one set, but pretty close to a set here of Dice Masters. So, and I have here, I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, with one acting as the lid. That easily fits in there, so I figure you can fit 100 dice into two of them. Uh, so what, they sell them as a set of three for $10. So I don't know, it's interesting. They wouldn't look as good on your shelf. I kind of like the idea of having something in a box or container, and there, I don't know how you would carry them. So. I like 90% like them, but anyhow, it's on Kickstarter right now if you're interested in getting these. Then we have some more box inserts from insertherere.me, made by Robert Searing, who's the web master of the Dice Tower website. And these are made from the foam core. And so I got one here for one of the, my games I really have enjoyed that's come out recently, Deus, which has all the different coins come out in a little container. So you can keep those separate and use those for the, the game. And also all the other pieces. This box here comes out like this. And you'll notice underneath here, there's a storage for the different hexes. And over here, the different player boards that they have. So it all fits together very nicely. Keeps my box organized. Like it very much. I've done, already done the flip test where I move these around and the pieces stayed in, so that's good. And then, one of my favorite games also here, Roll for the Galaxy. So inside you can see we got the boards and stuff on the top, and then inside a place to put the cups, and over here you have the different tiles. You might not want to throw them in a bag, just draw them from here. And then all the different dice, and then underneath those the victory points and the different counters and the starting tiles over here. A very nice organizational thing. So again, if you're interested in getting any of these, you can contact Robert by going to insertherere.me. So a couple weekends ago in the United States here, we had the Kentucky Derby. And I know a lot of you don't want the excitement to end. You're wondering, how can I bring the race for the roses to my gaming table? Well, you can't. The fundamental problem with every racing game is there's really no strategy to a race. Uh, it's summed up really well in this clip I'd like to show from an episode of The Office. So what's your strategy for this race? Well, I'm going to start fast. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to run fast in the middle. What? Then I'm going to end fast. 
See, in a race, since the only decision is to run fast, most racing games are not actually about racing. They're actually about betting. And as far as that's concerned, there's no better game out there than Reiner Knizia's Winner's Circle. The mechanic is fairly basic. Players make bets on four of seven different horses that are up for contention. These bets are secret and have different values. The hallmark of the game is a co-optition where you work together on horses where you share bets and work against each other on horses where you don't have bets. Now, Winter Circle, like most Kinesiate games, is really just a math problem. The horses all have attributes for different kinds of mathematically distinct speed. The horseshoe, which shows its swiftness of foot. The jockey helmet, which shows the skill of the rider. The horse head, which shows its determination and will to win. And the saddle, which represents some fourth thing. Despite the fact that it was released in 2001, Winter Circle has aged incredibly well. It's actually very similar to last year's Spiel des Jahres Winter Camel Cup, but uh, for my money, it's a much better game. In my own weekly game group, the only game more popular than Winter Circle is X-Wing. And that says a lot for a 15-year-old game. The heart of the game is the unparalleled social interaction that happens at the table. So all those Kinesia haters out there who say his games never have any theme can just go to now, Winter Circle is out of print, but luckily, Robinsberger is bringing it back with a few small changes. This time, instead of betting on horses, you're betting on adventurers trying to escape a dragon. Okay, I take back what I said about all your Kinesia haters. You're all right. <laughs> okay, well... A few less reviews maybe last week, although if you missed it, we did a top 10 list of our favorite video games. Now, this is not our ordinary top 10 list. This is one of our Kickstarter things where we were going to do some pop culture top 10 lists. And so we did one on our favorite video games. And of course, the video game people are going to tell us how incorrect we were, but we just thought we'd talk about our games and maybe you could see how that affected maybe what board games we liked. Anyhow, it was fun for us to do and you'll see more of that in the future. We'll probably do movies and TV shows. Reviews coming this week. Hey! Brew Crafters, you'll like to see that one. Emergence Event, which is a cool name and cool box. Xeno Shaft Onslaught and The Witcher Adventure Game. So then there's more reviews and those coming up and a lot of reviews from our contributors. Lots of stuff on the channel this week. Like I said, hopefully a live show and more. Another top 10 list is coming up this week. Oh, for the life of me, I can't remember what the topic is, but there's one coming. Okay, anyhow. Oh, also, check out the Dice Tower. All the stuff on our networks. All the pages are getting interlinked. It's becoming more and more full. The site's getting better as we go by. So check that out. Anyhow, let's move on. Hello. I'm Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, and I like so many countless others, have a cautionary tale to share about the dangers of succumbing to the lures of the collectible card game, or CCG. My story takes place in the mid-1990s, that decade that began six years after the Hot Pocket was invented, but ended six years before Jim Gaffigan would publicly ridicule them on a stage in Chicago. Now you can have a Hot Pocket for breakfast, a Hot Pocket for lunch, and be dead by dinner. It was during this strange collection of years that I fell victim to the siren song of the CCG. And, like so many others, mine was Magic the Gathering. At our peak, my friends and I got together to play Magic twice a week. And, and this was while I was still just a broke college student. <laughs> oh, no, no, but don't worry. I swear I didn't blow my student loan on Magic the Gathering cards because my wife watches this show. But let's just say that enough of my collegiate funding found its way into the pockets of Wizards of the Coast that soon I was engulfed. From fallen empires to Ravnica, the result was, well, the result was a lot of cumulative upkeep. Eventually, my student loan payments and I decided that it was time to move on and that I would invest in the CCG no longer. It was actually liberating, what with no longer chasing rares and habitually cracking open fresh new packs. I'm not made of stone. Now, ever since rebounding from my magic the accumulating phase, surprisingly, my collectible card craving has sat silent, satiated. 
And as the years continue to just churn by, I've wondered if the bug has worked its way through other people's systems too. Is the collectible card game market as we once knew it dead? Now, I know that Magic the Gathering itself isn't dead. I mean, it's the product that keeps many game shops afloat. I'm referring to the CCG formula in general. Uh, for example, Wikipedia lists 21 collectible card games that were released in 2006, and 21 more in 2008. But in 2013, just five. So, does the collectible card game still have traction in the marketplace? Or is it a concept that, even if it appears to still be hot on the surface, is just a shell masking a cold, lifeless interior, like a collectible cardboard hot pocket? Okay, now we're in the top 50 of my favorite game expansions, and really, I, I really kind of feel a, a, a turning point here where I'm like, wow, these are really great expansions. So let's get into the first one, which is More Cosmic Encounter. Now, this is an expansion for the Mayfair version of Cosmic Encounter, not the new one from Fantasy Flight. Now, I loved Cosmic Encounter and all its uh, different uh, uh, versions across the years. The Mayfair version was the one that really grabbed me because there was so much in the box. But more Cosmic Encounter, which was the expansion that came out in 1992, I believe, and it just had so much more. I mean, a ton more aliens. It added lucre and, and uh, uh, moons and all kinds of nonsense and good stuff. I mean, there's some garbage in that box, but there's some great things, too. Now, this has been superseded by all the Fantasy Flight expansions that have come, though those combined beat out more Cosmic Encounter. But when it came out, this one single expansion added so much much material to Cosmic Encounter, which already had a ton of things in it. It was very exciting. I liked it a lot. Then we have Heroescape Fortress of the Arch Kyrie, or however you pronounce the name of those. This took Heroescape and added castle building terrain to it. That's it. But it was neat, and it added this, you could build giant buildings now. Before with Heroescape, you could build buildings, but you'd work really hard and use a lot of different pieces. With the castle walls, you can now build things up faster and build massive fortresses that were a lot of fun to play with. And better yet, for a while, not now, sadly, but for a while, these they were like selling these for nothing practically, like 10 bucks a set. I have like 10 sets of the castle stuff. I can build this mega castle. As soon as my son gets older, I'm sure he'll love to put together castles with me and play Heroescape. My daughters like it now. It's just fun. Um, and so that's a cool expansion. Ticket to Ride Asia. I like Ticket to Ride a lot. I like the different expansions. Asia was cool for a couple reasons. One, I like the Asia region, so that's fun. It was a double-sided board. But one of the sides added the team variant, where you had partners. You could even play six players, where you and a partner were working together to complete routes. It's just that you weren't really sure what your partner was doing and what cards he was saving. So it made for a very cool uh, partner-style game. There's not many of those out there. A neat way to play Ticket to Ride. It has a different feel to it, and I certainly recommend it. Then the Tribune Expansion, which is, yeah, it's called the Tribune Expansion. <laughs> uh, Tribune's a great worker placement game, and the Tribune Expansion basically added more places to place things. It added a whole separate board. It added special cards. It added assassins. It added like a, 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 a almost like a computer style player to the game, another player, and you could play more players. Not everything in it was fantastic, but just the more options. I already liked Tribune a lot, and this expansion just really elevated it to making it, oh, what a great worker placement game. And then finally today, another Heroescape expansion, and that's Heroescape Marvel. Now, when the Heroescape Marvel set came out, like, yes, we're going to see lots and lots and lots of Marvel superheroes, and that didn't happen. This was it. And it was kind of weird because these were like 300-point characters as opposed to the, you know, before there was, I think, uh, the giant was 220 points, and it was like, oh, that's so much. And now Spider-Man and Iron Man and the Hulk were, Hulk was 400 points. But... Even though some people didn't think these mixed well with the other sets, which still makes no sense to me because I never understood how people had a problem. They're like, well, uh, please do not bring your superheroes into my monsters, robots, fighting giants, uh, revolutionary war soldiers, and, um, you know, uh, come on now. Why can't we bring superheroes in? And it was fun to add them in. 
But what really made the set cool was that it sparked on the internet there are so many superhero custom made cards that are really worked hard on by people who play test the snot out of these. They're as well balanced as anything that, that uh, Hasbro put out. And so this set kind of sparked that. And it, I actually think that the HeroScape system is my favorite fast way to play a superhero game, even over something like um, uh, Hero Clicks and things like that. It just works really well in that regard. Anyhow, that's five more expansions. See you next time. Hey gamers, welcome to the bakery. My name is Doug, the board game baker. Today we're going to be discussing my favorite topic, me. I'm excited to introduce this new video series on game design and my own attempts to create a unique playable board game. Uh, every week we'll cover a different area of game design from initial concept uh, through mechanical design where we'll see how those mechanics can enhance the gameplay. Uh, we'll look at the graphic design and see how the graphic design can, can guide folks through the, uh, through the gameplay. And then we'll talk about how to build a playable prototype and we'll take that playable prototype out into the real world uh, into various game stores and we'll see how we've done. In every episode, we'll discuss a specific topic. I'll give you my thoughts and we'll explain various aspects of how those thoughts are going to be incorporated back into the prototype and how that ultimately affects the gameplay within the game. And I'm not sure if this is how every game is designed, but uh, this is certainly the way I like to design games. And uh, we'll run through this journey together and see where we end up. In the next segment, we'll talk about the importance of the initial game concept. We'll talk about the various aspects that make up a good concept, uh, how you incorporate theme, game mechanics, uh, victory point conditions, and player interaction. And we'll talk about how that all of those really mix in to make a good uh, story arc for, for the players. You're ultimately trying to tell an interesting story for the players and make sure that they have a good time. So I am interested in your feedback as well during these segments. So if you have any suggestions or comments, please leave them below. If you get a chance, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Board Game Baker. That's Board Game Baker without any spaces because spaces are evil. And I'll catch you next time. In a world of Catan and Monopoly movies, two men dared to pitch better big screen board games. Kemet is an action selection, airy control game set in ancient mythical Egypt. The players build their pyramids to gain the favor of the gods and control of mythical creatures to go out and conquer the various temples and cities of the land. A Kemet movie would be a mythological high adventure ride like Clash of the Titans or the Scorpion King. Ancient Kemet is composed of a loose confederation of cities that live in relative peace and prosperity. The benevolent sun god Ra grants them his light and a fertile land. Ra is played by Idris Elba from The Wire and Thor. However, a dark cabal, the priesthood of Set, has begun infiltrating the cities. The high priest of Set is played by Adrian Pastar from Heroes and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. This priesthood of Set has corrupted several cities and their leaders, turning the people to worship Set and other dark gods. This newfound worship increases the dark god's power, led by Set, played by Ashraf Barholm from the new series Tyrant. The evil gods rise up and imprison Ra. The land falls into perpetual darkness, and the inhabitants of the corrupted cities are transformed into wear stuff. Wear cats, wear dogs, wear snakes, wear crocodiles, and I guess even wear scorpions, because I just really want to see wear scorpions. A young princess of one of the cities, Nefertari, played by Natalie Emanuel from Game of Thrones and Fury 7, she leads her people and banishes the priesthood from the city. Nefertari then rallies the people of her city to finish construction of the city's pyramids to strengthen Ra and the other benevolent gods. These benevolent gods send Nefertari great beasts like giant scarabs and mighty war elephants. Nefertari and her army must liberate the other cities of Kemet. Will Nefertari, leading the charge atop her flaming phoenix, be enough to liberate Kemet? Here's the tagline, when gods fall, darkness comes. Is this a movie you'd like to see? Would you cast it differently? Let us know in the comments below. Until next time, we're the Dukes of Dice. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Poker, the Wild West, and Dice. What a combo. Throw in the frequent collaborators of Bruno Cathala and Ludovic Montblanc and you get Dice Town. Let's take a quick look at the recently released iOS app version.
In Dice Town, players compete to build up their stash of gold, cash, and property. Each player has a set of five dice with card faces nine through ace on them. And each value corresponds with the location in Dice Town. The person with the most of a given face at the end of the rolling gets the location's benefit. For example, the most nines will get you gold nuggets and the most kings will get you the sheriff badge. The game ends when all the property cards are purchased or all the gold nuggets have been pulled from the mine and the person with the highest total item value wins. The Dice Town app is polished with a lot of nice features and a few omissions. The rules are laid out quite well, allowing you to skip to the section you want to read up on, and there's a complete interactive tutorial as well that does a good job of walking you through the mechanisms. I also really like that the town and poker hand reference is really easily accessible at the top of the screen, and a text bar at the bottom tells you what's happening in-game as actions take place. But this is purely a solo game. There are no multiplayer options at all, either on or offline. And this is a shame because having played Dice Town in real life, I can tell you that a lot of the fun of the game is the player interaction. When you're the sheriff choosing who to give a tie to, it carries a lot more weight when it's people you know as opposed to an AI character. Speaking of AIs, there are a lot of options, but you have to unlock them by completing achievements. It's not a huge deal, but something to be aware of. And you can also only have one game running at a time, and I always prefer when you can have multiple games saved at once. Dice Town is quite fun in real life. It's raucous and loud with a lot of take that. Dice Town the app is fun too, but in a different way in which you focus more on the odds and the dice mitigation. If that sounds like fun and you want a polished solo game, give Dice Town a try. Folks, uh, I don't have a big rant to go on today, really, or anything. I just want to talk a little bit. Last week, I had a chance to to go on a cruise with my family, which was an extremely relaxing. I've never not worked that much before, and it was very relaxing, but I did go a little crazy. I took a few small board games to play with me, and we played them, and that was fun, but we, we didn't, I didn't play board games much at all, uh, although I did meet two people who've uh, heard of the Dice Tower. Uh, we played a... Uh, a game on the ship, uh, there was a, a quiz show of heroes and villains, and I thought, ooh, I can handle that, and I went, and I won! Well, I tied with a couple other people, but still, we won. I got 19 out of 20. I did not know who the bionic woman was. I know, I know, but I'm still younger than that, I think. But anyhow, uh, when they announced my team name, I called us the Dice Tower, and so then some people said, hey, we know you, which I thought was cool. They had a board game room on the ship, which was okay. I think there's like 10 copies of Clue, four copies of Monopoly, a copy of Yahtzee, and... Yeah, it wasn't that spectacular. Um, I saw some people playing um, Boss Monster, and then some people playing Bridge and uh, some trick-taking games and Uno and such uh, in that in that gaming area. And I know that Board Game Geek did a cruise, and so some people have been pestering me uh, to do a Dice Tower cruise, and I, I, I can see the viability. I was like, I don't know if I would want to do that, but there's so much free time on a cruise. And you can go and eat, and you can go on the islands, and then come back and play games the rest of the time. So it sounds like a cool idea. It is a pricey thing, and I, that's why I didn't go on the Board Game Geek Cruise, because it, you know, when I go to a convention, I can say I'm working at the convention, and I am. Going on a cruise is uh, most definitely a vacation, so I can't, you know, that's, that's different and it's expensive. Um, but I wonder, you know, it seems like it's a good idea. Uh, everyone who went on the Board Game Geek Cruise told me that it was an amazing time. And I wondered if maybe some people would be interested in something like that on the East Coast. Because the Board Game Geek Cruise it was, over, it was based out of Texas. What if there was something based over here on the Eastern Coast? Now this seems like it would be a lot of work to set up. And my biggest fear of it, other than the amount of work be to set it up, and there might even need to be money placed you know, to reserve things, is it's a pricey affair, right? Uh, the Dice Tower is always about being inclusive. Now, gaming in of itself is expensive. Games cost money. You can buy a few games, though, and they can be incredibly fun and have a lot of fun. And that's what we want to, we want to promote. Or go to, you, know, you can buy no games and hang out with your friends who buy games. Going on a, on a cruise is most definitely not a cheap thing. It's a luxury item, and I wonder if it almost goes against the spirit of the Dice Tower. I'm just very curious what you guys' thoughts would be on that. 
Um, would you be interested in something like that? This is obviously not something we could throw together. This is not something that I'm saying we're going to be doing this. It's just something I'm kind of curious about. Is it something that's worth doing? Because I, now that I've gone on one, I see how that would be kind of cool to go eat at the buffet and then go down and play games, to get up and go swimming and then go. I mean, it's the Dice Tower Convention itself is held at a resort, and this has a lot of the same properties to it than that. Then again, maybe people just want to go game at a convention, or maybe you think that the cruise isn't the right spot. I don't know. It's just curious. I'm thinking about it. That's all. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. All right. Well, there's a lot more to come. Let's get to it. This is Gene, and we're gonna sing. A, I'm gonna sing a song for Gene. Okay, but I need to ask you a few questions really quick, Gene. Okay. Uh, first off, what? Uh, tell me, um, what? What's your favorite board game? Do you think? I'll go with the, a new one that I played this time, which was the Alchem. So you're like Alchemist. easily, you're very easily swayed then, because like yes. you just barely play it, and it's not yeah. your favorite game. Out of all, it's called the Alchemist. Like Why do you that. like the uh, the game, the Alchemist? I don't know, because it's cool. Because <laughs> it's cool. All right, you like the Alchemist because it's cool. Um, also, okay, we could go to Legendary. 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 Card game. Legendary card game. That's the DC one, right? Yeah. Legendary That's DC. Marvel. 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 Ooh, I don't know. If it's all the same to me. Boy, superheroes. All right, so it's so it's Legendary Marvel. Marvel one, okay, mm -hmm. and you like alchemy, yeah. but you don't, and you don't know why. It's, but it's, but it's pretty cool. It was cool. Well, I killed everyone. You killed everybody. I won. Okay. I just won. You just won, which is murder. I'm gonna sing a song about a girl who's mean. I'm talking about a girl in a red shirt. Her name is Jean. That's right, oh can't you see, she likes to murder, likes to maim when she plays alchemy. <laughs> That's right, there's Spider-Man, gonna kill him just as quickly as she can. That's right, my girl Jean rocks, but when it comes to playing Marvel, she would rather be Doc Ock or Mean Jean. She's such a scream. Me, she, the end. That was awesome! Alright, that was good. Please somebody help me on my feet again. Hi there, I'm Mikhail with Snakes and Lattes, and we're here today with Artem, who's talking to us about Cauldron. Cauldron is a board game of competitive alchemy. In Cauldron, you play a bunch of different potion brewing characters from different folklores. So you can be either a, uh, an alchemist, a witch, or a druid who compete in brewing potions by collecting ingredients from all kind of spooky fields like frog legs or you have the blood crystals or the webs and you combine them into potions scoring victory points. Magic. Um, so the goal of the game is to make sure that you collect ingredients that you want to score points for yourself while preventing other players from getting what they want. If you have played Carcassonne and you're looking for the next step, this is a game for you. If you have pretty advanced taste in board games, you would also be able to find a lot of the things that you would enjoy here. There's a lot of strategy, a lot of depth here. But if you think anything below Agricola is a no-go, maybe this would be too chance-driven for you. The way I like to view this game is basically a kind of a mix between Lords of Waterdeep with their resource collection and combining for points and uh, Munchkin because there is a lot of take that opportunities in the game, mostly throughout the spell cards. And there is a lot of interactivity, which is often done in this jokingly uh, uh, competitive slash aggressive way. <laughs> This was playtested as part of our designer night here at Snakes and Lattes, is that correct? Absolutely. In fact, it was featured on, I think, four or five nights during the last year. And many of the significant changes in the gameplay and in the, in the presentation of the game were driven by the feedback that I got here. For this time, folks, I really appreciate you sticking with us. Thanks for coming back this week. I'm so excited to show you some of these games I talked about. I'm so excited to just get on and, 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 and get more stuff ready. We are prepping full blast. Origins around the corner. Two weeks after that, Dice Tower Con. Four weeks after that, Gen Con. So there's a lot of cool things coming on your way. And our the closet is full of games to play. Some really neat ones showed up, so we're excited to try those out. 
Anyway, thanks so much for watching Board Game Breakfast, everyone. You're the best fans ever. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.